How are you? Hey. Let, let me announce on Twitter that it's starting and blah, blah, blah. All right, now I've got audio issues. Hold on. I'm not going to chance it. How you fellas doing? Good. How are you? Man, I'm great. Hey, Bobby, how do you pronounce your last name? Stroop, just like group. Gotcha. That's the way I thought, but I'd hate to announce, announce and say, no, it's Strop or something. Uh, well, I, I, I'm heard, I heard that some brothers got in a fight and somebody threw an E on there. It didn't make a lot of sense. Whatever. Let's see. I'm, I will announce uh, starting. Chris, have you had enough knowledge for the past few weeks? <laughs> yeah. Hey, is that one of those old fashioned Mattel football games and basketball games right yeah, behind your left shoulder? Yeah, who you think this is? Yeah. Oh, man, those are fun. Inspiration. I got Frogger up here, too. <laughs> uh, when, when, when we did the thing with Boo, um, he had to have a gun rack in the back. And <laughs> I was like, hey, I love the gun rack. He goes, oh, shit, I probably shouldn't have that in the background. So he fixed it around. Well. And how cool. did you, uh, the guy who, who kept talking to me about you, before I even knew who you were or followed you was Steve Jones from, uh, from Kimberly, Wisconsin. Yep. How did he run into you? So I got called in to green Bay, uh, to do some stuff and, uh, ended up parlaying that and speaking at a conference there, the power conference in green Bay, Wisconsin. And he was a presenter as well. And, um, I was impressed with him. He gave the same talk that, that you guys, uh, spoke about, um, on Twitter and I thought he did a good job you know I've been around a lot of good coaches and I think he's got the right stuff and the right mentality and I got a lot of value out of it and uh, just kind of hit it off with him yeah yeah he I, I think uh are we being recorded right now yeah we are recording so hey let's go ahead and announce this uh this is a 30 minutes a little 30 minutes late starting we're actually starting at 12 30 instead of 12 but we are with Bobby Stroop in the TFC podcast number 17. And um, one of the things I loved in your presentation, Bobby, is you said, I I'm a weird guy. And I, I think when people say I'm a weird guy or I'm different or something, it frees them to, to think differently and act differently. And you're no longer tied to the norm or tied to the middle. And can you address what you meant by you're a weird guy? Yeah, I, I just don't like constraints. I like to think freely and I don't want to be judged for my thoughts because they're, they're ideas. Um, I also don't want to dishonor people that have uh, poured into me or that I've learned from. So just saying that I'm a weird guy. I mean, when I was in college and people were going to Padre, I went and interned with different doctors and therapists and coaches because for as long as I remember, I wanted to do this, whatever this is. So I think that's a little bit different of a thought process um, than most. And, you know, like Chris noticed, <laughs> I'm, I kind of think of everything in uh, Mega Man and Street Fighter metrics. So <laughs> when I'm looking at people or evaluating things, I have all these like number of attributes from 80s video games in my head. So I'm just kind of probably a unique thinker. Uh, it doesn't make it good or bad. I don't know what it means. Now, does it have a battery in it? Do they turn on? Oh yeah, they turn on. We can Let's play see. it right now. Here. All right, turn one on. Yeah. That. What what year did those things come out? Oh, uh, late seventies, early eighties. That had to be yeah. It had to be like seventy eight or something. If I'm, I think Atari timeline somewhere in there. But yeah. Whoever That's thought crazy. a red blip could create so much fun? I know, right? It's just the most basic problem solving and you got to have imagination to even, I guess, draw any correlation to football or basketball, but I don't know. I love it. Hey, I loved your story about uh, your humble beginnings at APEC. You actually didn't call it APEC at the start. Do you want to uh, uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it taught me a lot. You know, I think when you're a young coach, you probably attribute a whole lot more to, to what you're doing. Uh, than the people around you. And, you know, quite honestly, I just had great coaches and mentors that put myself in a position to feel like 
I could go do something like that on my own. Uh, and then when I got the chance to do that, I realized very quickly that all the opportunities I were given was given uh, were because of what other people had done. And when I had to go try to figure that out on my own, 13 clients after going door to door for three months is a pretty harsh re reality to face. Um, and then realizing you know nothing about business because you, you name your business after a, a car, <laughs> a car part situation. Uh, it was just pretty humbling. And I've learned a lot and continue to learn a lot on a daily basis about, about those shortcomings. But, you know, it, it wasn't easy. Um, glad we're here. We don't want to do that again. <laughs> and I couldn't have done it without the people that I had around me. I love your logo because it has the lightning bolt in the A, which yeah, uh, that's, that's perfect. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I'm fascinated with, with, I don't know why, but I'm fascinated now with programs um, for older adults, maybe because I'm going to turn 62 soon, but I'm yep. also fascinated with how poorly are the youth in this country are trained. And it's basically due to too much special, specialization, too much game playing, not enough true play in the backyard, um, all those things. So can you tell us about your leadoff program? Yeah, so first, you know, our basic philosophy to long-term athletic development or whatever moniker you want to put on it is uh, movement literacy, right? So these, these, these are people before they're athletes, and we want them to explore their body and figure out what gifts God gave them individually. Really, it's exploratory to find out what, what is their signature uniqueness and make them move as, in as many ways as possible. So we gamify a lot. We have a curriculum that we're very serious about, but the athletes should never understand or know that. Uh, they should show up and play in our mind and do new things. And I get parents that are frustrated. It's like, why are my kids crawling? They're way more advanced than this. Um, and my, my feedback to them is that no matter what level of advancement you think your kid is, they don't get to skip, skip the stages of neurological development and tissue, tissue formation. So we've got a lot of things on a checklist that we believe in and we kind of have a bio banding situation where kids can graduate from level one, level two, level three to level four. And I know that's a 30,000 foot view, but you know, we're not doing, um, we're, we're not going to do resistance sprints with those kids. Uh, we're not timing and, and doing different metrics and things. It's more or less, can you do this? Let's try this. How many of y'all can do this? Now let's play a game and see if we can see what you guys do with the skills you just learned. And I don't like for kids to come up and tell me I'm a, I'm a tight end or I'm a point guard. So we kind of throw all that out the window. The games we play are sport agnostic. It's just skills that we feel like that we can build uh, within the constructs of what they come for. Now, the most difficult part is handling the parents. It's a hard thing to deal with. Tell us about Patrick Mahomes when he was a fourth grader. You know, I could, I could make up a story and lie about this, but I honestly don't remember. Um, that's why I, I thought. He was I just another kid, right? He's just a kid, and that's what's one of the best things about him. He's still a kid in a lot of ways. But, you know, when you have those kids out there, you want to view them as people that are they're going to live with that body the rest of their life. And we really put it as a priority, and we walk it like we talk it. And so all those kids have significant value to us, and it really is the heart of our mission, you know, mainly because my own personal – experience was I was a I was a kid that was the smallest kid boy or girl I was always picked last and man APEC was really born for that kid you know out of my own like what I what could I have done for myself so our our whole team is kind of a reflection of that and you know Patrick wasn't a, a standout in anything we did necessarily I'm not disrespecting him but until he got into middle school we didn't really notice a lot of special things about him and I don't mean that disrespectfully again but there was nothing that I'm just like, oh, you know, there's a mark or we need to keep an eye on this. You know, there, and then people are always like, well, he's a pro athletes kid. Well, let's make a list of the millions of pro athletes kids out there that never did anything. And then let's just get that off the table and quit acting like Patrick's success is a given for him. The, I, I saw a highlight tape once of Patrick playing basketball. Yep. And I described it as a, uh, I grew up with Pete Maravich back in the late sixties and stuff. And he really Pete. played basketball like Pete Maravich. I mean, he was yeah. pretty amazing. Uh, so he must've started showing some special skills in high school. Is that right? 
He did. In basketball, arguably, if you ask people around this area, was his best sport from a standpoint of it was a pretty obvious. Now, the disadvantage is Patrick's really borderline 6'2", so it, he, he wasn't going to go play NBA point guard. He, he doesn't have some of the physical traits you would want. But he most definitely plays the quarterback position like a point guard, in my opinion. And he pulls from a lot. Of, what he does is he uses the, the tools that he has. And that's the way he played the game, much like Pistol Pete did, in that anticipation, reaction, understanding angles, understanding how to read body language of your opponent. Those are some athletic attributes that, that Patrick's nurtured and identified over time and he utilized. And you're, you're exactly right. It's, it, you're you're on, on par with that and that um, that is the way he played the game of basketball. In my opinion, he plays the game of football that way. Was he a baseball player too? Of course he was a, a baseball player. That was a pitcher. Um, and, you know, when you go back and look, you'll see people throw up videos of him like hitting a home run when he's a little kid um, or making a throw or maybe making a half court shot when he's a little guy. But nobody's going to show you film of him out running anyone or out jumping anyone or doing any things that we, we say good athletes do. And that was kind of the thing. It was, hey, here's a kid that's got some skills, but he's not a good athlete, which I think is such a ridiculous statement to make. Um, and we just felt that there's so many things you can work on athletically. Speed can't be defined into a measurement between just two distances. You know, the archaic meaning of speed is to Im Im improve the value or, or, or to just make it better, right? It's not, it's not necessarily this thing that we've kind of put in the corner in a box, right? And he's got speed. It just doesn't look like everyone else's speed. Now, before I turn it over to Chris, um, I think a lot of times I hear people say, well, Jerry Rice was 4'6". It's, it's, it's crazy how people are defined by maybe one time that they ran on one day. It's just a snapshot of where they were. And I've always contested that, saying that Jerry Rice was faster than hell. And I mean, to ever argue that somehow slow is better than fast because Jerry Rice didn't it ran a 460, I think is wrong. Now you bring up the fact that that Patrick ran a 4.80 in the combine. Tell us why he should not be defined speed wise by that 4.80. Well, a lot of reasons, but the main reason is is that it wasn't our priority during the NFL combine process. And the reason is is because the question marks the NFL had for Patrick weren't that if he demonstrated that his athleticism on the field, because he did, it was, can he, can he learn an NFL playbook? Can he articulate NFL concepts, anticipate what defenses are doing? And can he clean up some things with his footwork and throwing motion? Well, a lot of, what a lot of people don't know is that Patrick had surgery right after his last game on his wrist. And it was pretty intense on his non-throwing hand. And he had some shoulder injury. He had double AC joint uh, separation, which is very painful. And so our priority was let's, let's get him to match up with a retired NFL offensive coordinator that can hold him accountable and teach him some things. Well, that guy's in San Diego and he wasn't, he wasn't coming back. He wasn't going to go anywhere else. Like he didn't have to. And then Jeff Garcia was going to go through some finer points with him. So he was with us for about a month and he went out there for about a month and then the combine happened after the combine, he was back with us preparing for the NFL season. We got back to working on speed as something that was a priority at that point. Now I'm not going to sit here and say that he didn't work on his start or then say, yeah, he did, but we didn't really put in a ton of time. Now, since then, speed has been a key performance indicator for him and a metric that we do monitor and he does compete at. So at this point, you know, last off season, I saw him beat guys that ran four or five at the combine. And these are guys that I trained to prepare for the combine. So I know what they did and then how they timed at the combine. And I see Patrick beat them in off-season workouts. So I know what he's capable of running and who he is. So he should not be defined as a 4'8 guy. No, and, and, and the four eight guys don't run 20 miles an hour on the field. And, they, and I get NFL next-gen stats, and I know he hits 20 miles an hour. Wow. You can't run a 4'8. You're not going to run a 4'8 and hit 20 miles an hour. Yeah, because if you can run 20 on the field, you can run 22 – uh, on a track in spikes. And if you can run 22, you're running four, four ish, four, five. I agree. And, and Patrick's never really running a straight line either. So if you're hitting 20 miles an hour in the way that he likes to, to move, um, I think people need to quit disrespecting his athletic ability or whatever they want to call it. You call it whatever you want. 
he runs away from people and he decides how he uses speed as a, as a tool to solve problems out there. And he I can use it. it. He's got it. Chris, I'm sorry I hogged the show so far. Oh, we got a bunch of questions up on the Q&A. Uh, in the presentation, you showed that Kelsey MB medicine ball throw is lighter with lighter ball moving slower than Mahomes with a heavier ball. What are the key limiting factors Kelsey has that don't allow the same expression of power with medicine ball? Is it a process with throws, sprints, jumps, and Mahomes just has more of it over time with you? I would say it's a combination of factors. I'm not, I don't want to act like that I'm the, the, the reason Kelsey isn't throwing a ball as hard as Patrick. I think, obviously, Patrick's had millions of reps at those things, but I think one of the things that makes Patrick very special as an individual is that his ability to express power from a multitude of different uh, types of situations, movements, and angulations. Kelsey is an incredible athlete, and he moves well in the frontal plane. No one would disregard or, or, or say different. But Patrick's spine can produce more power than any spine that I've seen or witnessed in the history of my career. Um, he, he truly is special at producing power. It, it, it truly is. It's just something I, I've never seen before um, on, it, with MLB players or other quarterbacks or really any other position. So I, I would argue that anybody in the world that you could bring in to monitor power from those types of movements, he's going to be competitive with anybody out there. I don't care what their sport is or who they are. Travis is, Travis is incredible, but Patrick can produce a lot more power in that movement than he can. At what age did you see that happen? Where did you see him make that jump? In middle school, we recognized that if you want to do something in a nine foot radius around somebody, Patrick's your guy. I mean, it didn't matter if it was throwing, striking, uh, swinging, or moving. And it really didn't matter what the movement was. Inside of nine feet, we recognized Patrick is that guy. I mean, he was incredible. And he started getting better. And the most important and I think thing he should get more credit for is he learned very quickly what he is good at and what he can do that other people can't. Stopping and starting in any direction that you could possibly move creating power from any direction, angle, swing. That's what made him different. And he knew that. You mentioned that you train mostly younger athletes. We recently started a speed school for fifth and eighth graders at our small school. We are always looking for ideas, skills, drills, and our games to implement. Can you share some of your favorites? There's so many. We like to have as much variability as possible. I, I think gamifying your warmups. I, well, I, honestly, I don't believe it in a warm-up, we just call it a fuse. But gamifying things, like Chris, I've seen you gamify skips quite a bit. We love to do that, make different plays on it. Um, that's probably the, the root of some of the things we do is just have variability and things that end up being monotonous or common things that we thread through our workouts. We try to add variability to that. We do a, so many variations of the game of tag. Uh, I think that's, a, that's the, the place you start is how many ways can you play tag and that's one of the better things to do with kids of any age. And honestly, I do that with athletes on the professional level at every sport too. So I don't care if you're in a bear crawl position, you only make them go sideways. It can only run backwards. There's so many ways to do it. So I would say at the root of it, you know, duck, duck, goose tag. That's, that's where we start. Couple other, couple of business questions. Um, so how are you do the, how is running a private facility and knowing how clubs get in the way, and I won't say get in the way, but they're a factor as well as the high school sports. How are you navigating and developing relationships between the club coaches, the high school coaches, where you may have coach X say, we need to run a lot more and coach Y saying, no, you need to do this. And then they come to your facility and you say, we need to do this. Yeah, I think it's important to first say that you know, we have a rule with our company that we won't say anything negative about a coach um, to a client. We won't participate. And if they want to come to us with negative things, we'll say, okay, up here, this is what we're going to do. And in relation to that, we're not going to redo that. We'll do, we'll do this instead. So we have that, that rule. Um, we don't spend time talking negatively or participating in it at our place. But I would say at the end of the day, it's the law of thirds, right? A third of the, the coaches – in your area that you're going to, whether you want to or not collaborate with, it, it can go really, really well. 
A third of them, it's going to be indifferent. They, they don't care. Uh, they don't, they don't want communication. They don't want to be involved. They're not, they don't want to be a problem. They don't care. And then a third of them are going to fight you on everything. And they're going to be mad that you exist. Uh, and they're going to make your life hell. They're going to try to run your business. Um, they're going to call you. I've been, I've, I've had parent meetings called by coaches where I've been called Martha Stewart. Um, I've been called of, you know, fake this, that, and the other, and, it just can get out of hand. Honestly, it's the biggest hell that we deal with um, in the private sector is people attacking us that we don't even know um, and saying things that we honestly can't defend. And it, it, it can be, it, it can be honestly, it's, it's the worst thing about what we do. It's the thing that people that are in the teams sector don't have to deal with. And I think they should have respect what we have to deal with on that a little bit more because it shapes the messages we have to put out. How many clients do you have? You have two facilities, correct? One in Fort Worth and one in Tyler? Right. So at our brick and mortar locations, you know, at the peak of our highest season, we'll carry a thousand clients in those facilities in a given week. Um, at our base outside of summer months, I would say probably around 500 clients in those brick and mortar locations, but we do a lot of offsite and our offsite where we send coaches out. So that could expand to 3000 or more, um, 5,000 or more at certain times of the year. And then we do consulting at this point, it's only to say it on a worldwide level. So we, we, we're, we have our two brick and mortar locations, but really we're a, we're a training company that exists to provide education and solve problems for people that are doing what we do as well. So on the other side of the second part of my question is, how do you deal with that moving up with NFL strength coaches? You know, we've seen Buddy Morris uh, call the private sector, what does he call them? Uh, personal terrorists. Terrorist. Yeah, yeah, we're terrorists. <laughs> you know, and we all know Buddy and, you know, half the time he's just on a constant rant but um how does that relationship work especially with someone like patrick where a lot of people want to get their hands on him and and say they've trained him or work with them is there a yes. is there a relationship or is there it's just it's just the way it is i think you know chris there's always a relationship whether you want to talk about it or not yeah. <laughs> or 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 it's something that is and and I'll, I'll just so to keep everybody off their into their chair okay buddy is a treasure and i i love what he does love what he's done love his career and i agree with him there are a lot of terrorists out there um and people trying to credit take and and do stupid stuff and he's right uh, next is i've got a great working relationship with the chief so i want to take that off the table uh, fantastic people rick burkhalter is uh one of the one of the greatest um and he's direct sports medicine for the Chiefs. You know, Andy Reid and those guys are have been awesome to work with. In that particular example, it's a little bit of an outlier. Um, they give us the freedom to, to do things that, that we need to do to, to get Patrick ready to play. And probably a lot of that is due to the fact that Patrick's an exceptional human being, so he kind of commands trust from people around him in all directions, and he's a good communicator. Uh, so that's a great situation. Now, we've been involved with over 200 athletes in six different professional sports. I would say about 60% of the time, what I'm explaining, you know, on, on the same end with Patrick is true, but another, you know, 33% of the time or so, it's going to be, it can be pretty aggressive. In those situations, I've got to work for the client because that's my, that's the person I work for. I don't work for the team. And in those situations, we keep things private. We do what we need to do. Um, we, we respect the volume and we, you know, I do my work for them privately. And those, those situations can, honestly, it's sad because we could help the athlete more if everybody was working together. I feel like it's fairly uncommon at this point, but it, it still can happen. One of the things that uh, my off season speed ideas or our training ideas, I should say, the focus is it's almost like a 50 50 deal where we want to stay focused like laser focused on absolute speed half the time and the other half the time we wanted to do adaptive stuff we want to do 
rotate. I love your rotational stuff. I mean, we call it X factor because yep. it is constantly evolving. Uh, like tomorrow I may do an X factor workout with nothing but the things I saw in your presentation. It, it's, it cool. really is like, your stuff is like total X factor. And one of the things with X factor is this micro dose, like, and, and you just do one rep of everything, which I absolutely love that idea. And I think that the saying that I, I say all the time, it's always in my head, don't burn the steak. In other words, we are not trying to get tired. Tired is the enemy, not the goal. We never want to let today ruin tomorrow. And so those concepts that you do, to me, it's like, I need to come out and visit you because you're like an X factor machine. You know, that's all the stuff you do. And the stuff you do this month won't be the same exact stuff as you'll do six months from now because you'll learn more stuff. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. I mean, we, I feel like the slow cooking analogy is, it makes sense. I mean, for us, look, I, I didn't get this sloppy 40 year old dad bod from what I did last week. Okay. This is a summation of a life of choices. And we look at training the same way. We want our athletes to kind of be a summary of what we've done leading up to this point at, 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 you know, at all points. So we love one set, sometimes one rep because of the psychological ramifications of that and the comfort in those situations. And also we've, we found that it brings the athletes to more of a primal state and we get more velocity and we get more power. And when you put a competitor and someone that you need to thrive in those situations in that training environment, we've seen nothing but positive things happen. And there's really no carryover. If you need to work speed the next day, you're going to be fine. And, and you should be optimized. It should be a potentiation effect. Um, and we just had a heck of a lot of fun with it, to be Not honest. Not only do you say that we don't want today to ruin tomorrow, use the word potentiation and optimization where, where you want tomorrow's workout to be amazing. So, so not only are you trying not to burn the steak, but you are trying to really undercook it so that you can cook it again the next day. Is that correct? That's correct. Because one thing's, and this is getting, we're getting, I'm going to get nerdy, but if you look at movements in the game, they're actually slower than the movements that I want to do in the days leading up to that. I want to expose them to speeds that are going to be much faster than what they actually need to access in the game because I want the neurological system to feel comfortable going beyond what is necessary in competition, because then I feel like power is going to be optimized in that margin in which they do need it. So for instance, throwing a football, uh, football has weight. You've got the constructs of the problem you're having to solve. Um, you've got to make a throw that is catchable. So it's going to be slower than if I take a towel and say in 15 seconds, you're going to get as many as you can in a complete throwing motion or I want you to set and solve a problem with a different arm slot every time in 30 seconds. That's going to be much faster. So if that's going to elicit a faster release time from his decision to ball being out, that's what I want. Same thing with speed. It's just like isolating a section of a sprint instead of running a full 60. I'm trying to get his fastest so that I see his fastest when he actually needs it. And and you are truly, the word conditioning is such BS because to most people, conditioning means doing a ton of volume, a ton of fatigue so that you're, you can play an entire game. But you are, I always say, you, you, you should train at 100 miles an hour to play 80 miles an hour in a game. And so you are truly trying to hit higher game speeds. And that is truly the correct way to condition an athlete to play fast in the game. I think so. I mean, I feel certainly in the days leading up to the game, now, the day after the game, I mean, there, there's value in the aerobic system being conditioned, but you don't have to condition the aerobic system system for that to happen. I mean, look, the value of the aerobic system in team sports is that your neurons stay hot. If your neurons stay hot, your communication's better. That means if a running back sits on the sideline for 48 minutes and he comes in on a third and 20 and needs to run a draw for 21 yards, he's not going to pull a hamstring because his neurons are his neurons are warmed and they're primed, so he can access the energy systems he needs to perform. That is the value of the aerobic system. But if you go look at a workout and you have long workouts in the beginning of a week, you are working your aerobic system just in the volume of a two-hour workout. 
you don't need to run down and backs and shuttles for the aerobic system to be conditioned. I mean, if you practice the right way, your aerobic system is more than conditioned. I mean, if these guys are, look, I mean, if they're eating seven bags of Doritos and taking drags off whatever, they're going to be deconditioned. But that doesn't mean you need to run more gassers. So a lot of people are starting, we have a lot of younger coaches that are starting uh, their careers. And some may want to get to the point where you're at, where you have two beautiful facilities. So what are three cornerstones that they can build off of to kind of get to the point where you're at? Oh, I don't think anybody should want to get to the point where I'm at. I think this- I mean, how many people can put Brad Pitt in the corner of their PowerPoint and get away with that? How can I mean, you have Meet Joe Black in there? That was a great movie. <laughs> well, because I can't look like that at all. Not any simulants or even a joke. So I was worried, man, because I have this sense of humor. And I was like, this is like the biggest flop ever. I thought it was funny, so I did it for me. But whatever. Oh, um, it was funny, too. It's just I was I, like, River Runs Through It. How come you didn't have River Runs Through It in there? I love it. I just didn't. I was trying to think quick. You know, think I was trying to think of wild characters that are kind of funny, but... You know, I shouldn't have let those two characters out. You're right. You're right. I shouldn't have. Um, but I, I just, look, everybody's got their own journey. I didn't arrive at this with some kind of roadmap. Okay. It's, I never had a goal of working with a pro athlete ever. That was never what I wanted to do. I wanted to help the kid that was me when I was young. That's it. That's, that's what I wanted to do. And um, we got here through a lot of blessings. And I would say this, work on what's in front of you. OK, I, I did a talk one time on 15 lessons uh, failing forward in the private sector, and I could probably make that available. But, you know, look, you got to work with what's right in front of your face. Every everything that you have the opportunity to work with, you've got to value as much as someone perceives that I value working with Patrick. Anybody that knows me uh, and has been in our space knows that the same energy and passion um, and, and need to help people. Everybody in our company has that same thing from the top down and the bottom up. It's a real thing. If you don't do that, you'll never get to what you think you want to get to. Um, you know, when you, when, you, when you start a business in Tyler, Texas, you can't, you can't tell people. People will commit you if you tell them you want to create a worldwide, you know, training power or whatever you want to call it. Like, that's ridiculous. You can't, you can't have stupid goals like that. You got to help people where they're at. You got to improve their lives to the field of human performance. And you got to protect futures of the people you care about. And that's really what we just stick to. That's our totem, right? And, you know, at this point, we've ended up being given some, some opportunities. And I'm a gambling man, okay? So anytime I've gotten money, I throw it all down on the table and bet, bet red or black. Um, we haven't missed yet. At some point, we will. But I wouldn't be setting goals on, on what I'm doing. And last thing. I'm worth more dead than alive, okay? I've got three life insurance policies because the bank made me. So don't set your goals as to what I'm doing. That's a foolish thing to do. The, uh, you, you talk a lot about feet. And um, I would love to get you in a room with, with Chris Corfist and Dan Fichter, who are both also obsessed with feet. And just video the entire discussion and it would be brilliant. Um, and for the average athlete, they live their life in coffin shoes, you know, that make their feet go dead, that, that you ruin all tactile sensation. Um, but you train the feet constantly. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say at least four days a week, there's going to be footwork. Um, for every athlete in season or off season, you know, everything starts in the foot, every transformational zone, every process from a tissue and neurological standpoint. So if you play this, if you play the sport standing up and you have issues in your feet, the issues will not stop there. So we've got to get everybody to their ground zero as many, as much as possible and dealing with a lot of athletes that, you know, NBA and Major League Baseball and NFL and the cleats are terrible. They can really teach you that you don't need your feet. And then you all of a sudden start having this little nagging tendinosis issue or, you know, you've got this hip or lower back pain and 
I'd say at least nine times out of 10, and I'd be interested to hear what Chris says, it starts in the foot and the ankle, you know, nine times out of 10. I would agree that everything's a response to three times your body weight falling on a leg that's got a whole bunch of bones, very small bones that aren't meant to take a whole lot of force, but somehow they do. Uh, and I, I agree completely with spikes. I think spikes are a major factor in injuries, um, especially spike placement, um, where the cleats are aligned to someone's foot because Nike or Under Armour, whoever, they mold one set of spikes, right? but everyone's got a different shaped foot. And so if you have uh, a knob in front of your, the ball of your big toe, that's going to be an early break. That's going to cause, it's going to throw a shearing force through the rest of your body. And I think that's a lot of times where you get these freakish blown ACLs is it's just the spike caught funny and the, the shearing force went somewhere else and something had to give. And it's always the ACL because we've got our ankles wrapped so tight that there's no way they can displace or dispense any of that force. Um, and you know, kids buy shoes and, and Nike comes up with new models every year that everyone has to have. And people don't understand the economics of mass producing shoes that it, they're gonna put an air pocket inside of a shoe because if you add up all the money for the thousands of shoes that they use or make and the foam that takes up that spot, they're actually making a fortune. And they say, air cushions, air is the softest thing. No, that's wrong. Compressed air, air in a, a pocket that can't let the air out is as hard as a rock. But yeah. yet we're gonna run on them and we're gonna tell people it's actually a lot softer. Um, you know, some of the shoe companies, uh, Mizuno, I should, probably shouldn't say that, but Mizuno, they have the wave. People have no idea what that wave in that shoe, where that shoots the energy. But yeah. it sounds good. We, it's a wave like the ocean and everything's the same in the world and it rolls things through. And just like when you hit the ground, or no, it doesn't. Look at how the shoe is shaped and where the last is and where it's shooting energy. It's a mess. So I agree. Um, shoes, spikes are the worst. Uh, and then we get people like uh, soccer players who, what's the guy's, Dia uh, Madonna. Uh, he wore spikes that, spikes that were two sizes too small. Yep. And so every kid says, well, I'm a 10, but I need to wear an eight because that guy did. No. <laughs> no. Right. The dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. So I agree. I think shoes cause a lot of problems. Um, and, and, and they're on the cheap, you know, people go by, they go to Dick's Sports and they buy the cheap ones. Why are they cheaper than at the other store? Well, those are defects. There's defects right. in the sole and that's why you're getting money saved. They're buying the rejects that they can't see. And uh, you think you're saving money, but you're really messing up your feet and the rest of your body. 1000%, you know, I used to work for a Oh, I would say a major shoe brand. And I was in some of these meetings and these youth youth meetings. And well, Bobby, we need to make a marathon shoe for kids. Uh, <laughs> let's 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 not do anything you just said. You know, well, we need the story. We've got to sell shoes. Well, this is not kids need one shoe. Let's make a great cross trainer. Well, we can only sell that one once. You know, so I no longer work for that company because all I told them was that. Everything sucks. They didn't like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, you guys are right on. I've been in those meetings. I understand what it's like. You have a salesperson, a marketing person, and then someone that wants to do the right thing. And the one that wants to do the right thing gets fired or removed from that committee. And it comes back to selling shoes, unfortunately. And, and making so, a profit, a bigger profit every year. And so trying to get a kid or, you know, their the target is usually females, trying to get them to have six pair of shoes in their closet is the priority over what they really need, which is just something that keeps them safe from the ground and it's flat and wide, basically. Uh, but anyway, yes, we do need to do that conversation, Chris. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, what are some recommend recommendations for track athletes when choosing spikes? Are there any spikes you recommend? You know, that's out of my scope. I think it depends on, you know, I love carbon fiber uh, for, for the performance reasons, but I think it just depends what's your event, I don't know your technique or how you utilize the foot when it hits the ground. I think those things are going to be best advised by your coaches, but 
make that decision consciously and understand what your forces going into that material are going to do coming back up out of that material in the relationship with your foot and the surface that you run on. Um, different tracks, different spikes are better. Uh, I, I love carbon fiber if it's legal wherever you run. I would certainly recommend you do that as long as you don't have a ton of dysfunctional patterns. Um, so, so maybe just completely erase what I just said because you, you might not need it. No, anyway, that's a long discussion. I'm probably out of my scope, honestly. Yeah, I would agree. Carbon fiber, if you've got good, if you've got good foot function, but if you don't, uh, you're going to get worse because now that energy is going somewhere else. Yep. One of the things that we like to talk about TFCs uh, is weightlifting, and I know Bobby, you you lift weights. You even talk about being traditional in your lifting early in the week, um, progressing to being fast on Friday and Sunday. Um, however, you also talk about um, some, some things that are overrated in the weight room, or actually you talk about certain things in the weight room that might contribute to hamstring problems. And I think that too often people who are weight room centric make blanket statements saying that we are going to make all of our athletes more durable by getting them super strong in the weight room. And, and maybe the, the better answer should be not everything will cause durability. What do you have to say? Yeah, I think strength and resiliency have a strong correlation, but I think that people can easily define resiliency, but they don't know what strength is. Um, you can watch a, someone, an athlete in, in a ballet and say, they're obviously strong, but then you go in the weight room and you're like, oh, I, I mean, I don't know what strong means. So it's, it can be very confusing. And I think in our, in our profession, um, as far as the hamstrings is concerned, you know, I think we could do this for a number of things. If I put my hand on the table and rotate my humerus, that's an important property. Like for instance, if I'm here and I can rotate my humerus, okay, that's great. But if you give me a bunch of free time and for anxiety, I like to do bodybuilding and all of a sudden I can only do this and I'm a quarterback, my career is over. So when you train the body to create adaptations around movements that aren't realistic for sport, you decrease performance. So if you do a ton of bicep curls, your elbow is going to flex well. Does your elbow flex and do that in the sport that you play? Now, I'm not over functional guy. Okay. I'm not, we're going to, we're going to lift weights because I, a lot of my athletes need a certain level of resiliency to conduct the power and speed. I want them to produce number one, number two, to be able to handle the types of drivers that are out of their control that are going to happen to them. Okay. So I'm not dismissing strength. We hit KPIs on strength on purpose, different people, different reasons, different things, different frequency, but on, on the issue of the hamstring, the hamstring really decelerates knee extension. That's what it does if you're moving. It also decelerates and accelerates the femur rotation and the tibia and fibula rotation. Now, if, that's, if those things are true, then when you lay on your stomach and you do a glute ham, you're teaching the hamstring to flex the knee. The hamstring should not be the prime tissue that flexes the knee. That should be a byproduct of gravity, hip position, and also really your body being able to control what happens off the ground. It shouldn't be something you need to consciously do or activate. When you teach the body to do that, you're going to create dysfunction because it's not going to rotate the femur well or control the tibia, the fibula, and decelerate knee extension. It's going to try to pull. And when it tries to pull, it's literally going to pull. It's, that's what's going to happen. So there's so many people that I know that are like, I don't understand. We do more glute hams. We do more razor curls. We do all this and we have more hamstring injuries and our, you know, whatever. Well, I, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious. Vern Gambetta said this 40 years ago. I mean, I don't know about Vern's communication or people's skills, but it doesn't make him wrong. For sure. Uh, one of the things that, um, that leads into a, a question I discovered through my 40 years of coaching track that my basketball athletes never got injured, never had hamstring problems. So in my head, I'm thinking multi-directional rotational work must be really, really good. And that really influenced all my X factor ideas. And then I also uh, was at a clinic about 10 years ago 
and listened to one of the, the great sprint coaches from Jamaica speak. And I asked him the question, what do you do for hamstrings? He said, we retro sprint up uh, gradual hills. So, so they, they run backwards as fast as they can up a yeah. gradual hill. And so once again, that fed into my multi-directional idea that somehow only lifting weights and sprinting in a linear fashion is somehow uh, asking for injury. I agree. And we do a lot of similar things. Backward running is a great bang for buck option because of what it can do for the big toe, properties of flexibility, stability, uh, and mobility, and for dorsiflexion of the ankle. But also it grooves that counter rotation that you need. It teaches the talus and the, the calcaneus to slide and move together in concert with each other. And it also teaches the body to extend the knee with the hamstrings. And it's, it's, a, it's huge. It's a, it's, it's a really easy thing that you can do. But another thing to think of is if you go take an athlete, like, like you, you take a track athletes and go run an agility drill, whatever that is, I'm being educated constantly. And you, you do an agility drill and then go like first time a 10, do an agility drill, go time another 10. Second 10 is going to be faster. Why? Because you're exposing the body to different driving forces and angulations through the hip and the spine and through those different counter rotation and and relative rotation transformational zones, they're going to come back and they're going to run faster because it's like oiling the axle. It works. And it just like an X factor thing will work. It's not really potentiation. It's neurological. It, it, well, that's potentiation too, but it's, it's more neurological ranges of motion and coordination, not, not necessarily just recruitment from a neural standpoint. And so I don't mean to go off on a tangent there, but there's a reason why your basketball players have less injured hamstrings because their body understands that movement is a lot more dimensional or a lot more multidimensional and multidirectional than linear or sagittal plane, probably better to say. Uh, there's a question up on the Q&A. Could you describe the process of locomotion pattern variations you use and how or why you apply those over a session or a season? First off, I know all the names are ridiculous and unnecessary, so I get that. You could just call it a lateral karaoke. I get it. But we use this in our fuse. So our fuse is what, you know, the stem that you light before the dynamite explodes. I've just found over time, if you tell athletes they're warming up, they're going to give you warm-up effort. So we don't, we say if your shoes are on or we're on the training floor, we're working out. This is workout. So a lot of times, the very first thing we do is locomotion. They're going to go, they're going to, they're going to move forward and backward without stopping. I literally give them instruction as it's going. So they're moving forward and backward at a certain time. I say, okay, weave like a snake. Okay. Now we're going to do alternating shuffles. Okay. Now you're going to turn and slide, drag the ground with your hands. Okay. Forward karaoke, backward karaoke. And then I'll just keep going and challenge them. It shouldn't last longer than two and a half, three, four minutes. Uh, but you're going to find a pattern they can't do. And then when they can't do it, I move to my dynamic stretches and we move on. So it's a way to, to get blood flow in some areas you need some nutrient rich attention. It's a good way to get the mental cobwebs out before you do what you need to do. Uh, it's a great way to get the body moving in patterns that they think is boring doing it in a static position. Um, there's really no wrong way to use it. In my opinion, we use the heck out of it before workouts, after workouts, in the middle of workouts, as a filler, you know, whatever, we use it. How many of your professional athletes use RPR? You know, we were late onto the RPR uh, wagon. Um, all of our major league baseball athletes use it. You know, here's the difference between a major league baseball athlete and an NFL athlete. NFL athletes don't think anything matters. Major league baseball players think way too many things matter. <laughs> so major league baseball players, they want to know everything. They're into the weird stuff. I mean, these guys are up late at night burning incense, whatever. They, they'll do whatever. It doesn't matter. If you tell them don't wash your socks, they won't do it. So um, they, they were hook, line, and sinker all in. It was pretty easy, you know. Football guys are like, what are you doing to me? Why are we doing this? Can we sprint? Can I jump? Can I throw something? You know, Patrick, as an example, and we work with a lot of different athletes in sports outside of this, but as an example, first time I had him do it was this summer. And I'm showing him and he's like, all right, what, what's next, man? Like, I trust you, but can we go? Like, can we go? So I said, all right, I got it. 
So I bookmarked that in my head. Now we're doing sets. I'll just come up behind him and get him. It's over. He didn't think about it. If you ask him if I did it, he probably wouldn't even remember it. Um, I'll just hit it all in a workout just randomly between sets of whatever when he's resting. So he doesn't, so the time goes faster. He doesn't feel like he's just sitting there. Um, and then if I don't do that, I'm in communication with every therapist or whomever takes care of him. And I'll say, I want you to do these four in order and then do these four in order. And they'll just do it. Like if he's getting a massage, he's got his earbuds in or whatever. They just do it. And he's just like, yeah, I got a massage. He doesn't know. He's like, I don't know what he, if you ask him what RPR is, he wouldn't be able to tell you. That's great. The uh, traditional quarterback training. I mean, as a, as a coach myself, I remember like everything. I, I was a qu quarterback. Um, um, I coached quarterbacks for 25 years, always offensive side of the ball. And, and quarterback training, uh, basically I was trained to be Johnny Unitas. And I think that the traditional, you know, everything has to be absolutely almost mechanical to a yep. quarterback. And to think that, that that type of training, the type of stuff that you are doing with quarterbacks is not just Patrick. I mean, you're doing it with like all of your quarterbacks. Um, I just cannot imagine the difference in, in my career had I been taught like that. Do you want, are you the only guy that's teaching this kind of stuff? Oh, I think a lot of it, I, I might be, um, but I've had a lot of great influences and there's been a lot of pioneers in that space. Um, you know, be the best you is our mantra. I like everyone to look at themselves as an individual and try to figure out how they do things. Problem solving is the root of it. But, you know, guys like Tom House really, now Tom was very private about it. He didn't want anyone to know what he was doing, but he was doing a lot behind the scenes and he changed a lot of the way quarterbacks can approach or view how they train themselves from a physical standpoint. And Tom's a friend of mine and someone that I've drawn a lot of inspiration from. You look at different major league baseball programs and things out there. There's a lot to draw inspiration from. I think what we've done different is look at how that fits and plugs in with the actual training philosophy and approach to individualization. And one of the biggest problems that I always had is I could never get a quarterback coach to come work with me and Tyler with my guys. Um, and it's like, well, you know, all they got is me. Well, that's kind of, a, that's a pretty big problem for them. So I'm thinking, okay, I can't coach them on how to play quarterback, but I can try to do some things that might make them better at quarterback. I know that sounds really stupid uh, to verbalize that, but that's exactly what my thought process was is how can I ride that, you know, walk that line. And what we found is that our guys were doing some things that were just, they were happening frequently. And quarterback coaches would be like, oh, we can't run an offense with them doing all this stuff. And that, that, that's flukish. And I'm like, if it's flukish, how come all 28 of our quarterbacks this year, regardless of their 40-time vertical weight room numbers, are literally all making plays like this? Like, why? Started drawing correlations, trying to get rid of things we don't think had anything to do with it, and doing more of what we thought did have to do with it. Um, and then it, we just have arrived at kind of things that are non-negotiables that we do now with our, our throwers. So, you know, you, you can't try to be the best Peyton Manning because you're not Peyton Manning. It, technique is, de, is defined by your physiology, okay? You, you don't get to have your technique and then your physiology follow that. So we just feel like we need a training program where kids figure out how to do the things we want them to do with what – their skills and tools and gifts are. Are, are you training um, that great quarterback from South Lake Carroll? Yes. So I've been working with Quinn for a while and boy, is he special. He's, he, he's, he's the best quarterback in the country, right? High school. He's ranked the number one quarterback and the number one player in the country. Where's he going? Uh, currently he's, he's going to Ohio state, but he was going to Texas a few months ago. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm actually speaking at South Lake Carroll High School um, in January, and I'm hoping I, I get to meet the guy because I hear he's going to be uh, pretty special. He's special, but what's even more special is his blonde mullet. It's incredible. I'm going to make sure you meet him when you come down. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. And by the way, I have been to Tyler, Texas. Um, is Tyler, Texas still dry? It isn't now, but that just happened about eight years ago. 
Um, but yeah, the, the rose capital of the world, um, that's us, man. What were you doing in Tyler? Well, it's crazy. I just had a, a vacation exchange and, and uh, I said, okay, kids, we're going to Tyler, Texas. It was some like, we ended up on some pontoon boat in that crazy lake and a big storm blew up. And I swear to God, I thought we were all going to die. And, but I remember going to a great Mexican place that made their own tortillas. And we had to like sign up for some liquor card, you know, like to have a liquor license in order to have a margarita there. The, the margaritas were $1, but you had to pay like $20 a piece for the damn liquor license. That was Mercado's, I bet. It was, it was. It was the best place I've ever eaten. But I was a little bit pissed. I had to drop that money on a liquor license before I got to have a margarita. Well, I wish you would have used that license a little more, but we can, we can go back to Mercado's when you come in town. Oh, I can't wait. I, that would be that would be beautiful. A couple of the freaky things that you dropped in your presentation, that Patrick. Uh, now, the only thing I saw online was that from the knees throwing sixty-five yards, but you say he's throwing seventy-four. Well, that throw was actually seventy-five yards, but I didn't think that if I put that out there, it would be taken seriously. So, if you really look at the distance. Um, if you, if you look at the, I mean, you got to remember at that point in time, he was a sophomore in college and he didn't really have a draft grade um, or anything. And I didn't want to put something out there that would be outrageous. But if you go look at the distance on there, you know how long, how wide that track is because you know track distances. And then you go look on the yardage on the field, look at the height of the fence, and then look at where that ball actually lands, the trajectory. We went out and measured that. That's 75 yards. 75 so, yards is a long throw for a great quarterback on his feet. Right? Yeah, I mean, Quinn, Quinn throws 75 from a standing position right now, and there's a few others, but um, Patrick can probably hit – well, he can throw further than 85 yards standing. And he also can uh, deadlift 600 pounds? Yeah, he can deadlift 600. In the offseason, we try to get close to a, a max one time, and then we go away from it for the rest of the entire year. Um, but he, this kid is a, is a tank and he likes the way it feels to lift heavy weight. So I gotta, I gotta give him a little dessert every once in a while. And, um, the guy's strong. I mean, he wasn't always like that. He fell in love with weights after he quit playing baseball in college and he really got into it. And so I have to kind of almost temper him with it. And he's, he does lift. I mean, we'll lift, he lifts heavy now, really heavy about every other week um early in the week and through different variations of movement in the in the season we we don't go above you know 65 percent really on deadlift um and i'm more looking at meters per second and speed um and it's usually one rep and you know it's one rep so chris did you have something no, I'm good. I'm trying to figure out what my children are doing. They're supposed to be cleaning the house and they're doing something else. That's good. I, just, I have a lot of stuff and I don't want to hog it. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't know if you saw Cal Dietz's presentation, but he showed the okay. owl where he turned the owl in all direction and the eyes and head stayed right there. It's just an amazing reminder of the rotational abilities that we have. And and then you showed, you showed uh, um, Patrick doing like a 180 lunge where he turned his head all the way around just like an owl. And you also mentioned how no matter how crazy his body is, how his head stays still and his off arm stays still. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. So I did watch uh, Cal's presentation and that effect is exactly what we want from our throwers pitchers or quarterbacks or javelin. I don't care who it is. Well, not javelin necessarily because they don't have a target, but you want your head still and you want your front side arm still. That's going to create a pendulum effect. So in my mind, there's two types of rotation. There's real rotation. So how you can actually rotate and move and there's relative rotation. These have a relationship, but they're not the same. The relative rotation is how well your body rotates around a, 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 a tissue or a joint or, or just a, a bookmark place. And we want our quarterbacks and throwers to have the highest level of relative rotation possible. It's just like if you play tetherball, it's all moving and everything's good and great. But when that rope catches, that's when the velocity happens. Think of your ability to stay still 
and allow for that relative rotation phenomenon to happen is when that the rope on a tether ball uh, game catches. That's when things should speed up around you. And, and really, when you stop, that's when everything else speeds up. So you want the guys to extend out in front. You want them to finish. And that's one of the best ways to get guys to finish. You start moving your head. You watch a thrower that's inaccurate. Watch them do this. Watch them do this. Watch them do this, this, this. And if they, they're going to do it different with every throw, that's why they never know where their throw is going. And that's a problem. So a lot of the no-look passing concepts come from him just deciding – this is where I'm going to hold still. My vision is going to continue to read what's happening, and I'm going to throw that thing here. But that's his best attempt at keeping still, not necessarily not looking. Because it's not truly a no look. He is looking. He's just not turning. Those are two different things. With as funky as Patrick is and as different as he is, um, has, has, have any of his coaches tried to put him in a box or have all of his coaches say, Patrick, we want you to be Patrick? That's a great question. He's been lucky. Well, I shouldn't say lucky. Obviously, he's got some skill in the way he makes people feel um, in his interpersonal skills. And so people haven't really tried to have an intervention with him. Um, I think early in middle school and high school, obviously, you're a coach. You're trying to get everybody to a certain level of proficiency. So you can't really blame those coaches for trying and I think that might have been some of the reason why he didn't start till the third game of his junior year at quarterback. You know, he wasn't the quarterback even for his grade, um, probably because his technical model was just so far off of what they were teaching for their programs that it was kind of hard to recognize what his real skills were. Right. But no, when he got to college, I mean, the, the reason no one liked his skill set. You guys can say that all these people saying whatever they did. OK, nobody wanted him for quarterback except Cliff Kingsbury. Nobody. Nobody, nobody, even his senior year, a couple people came in late. It was people that were like, when you start getting offers from people that are in the hot seat, you know, that they're like, Hey, risk it. Who cares? Let's see if those kids can do it. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that. Cliff was the first and the only guy that said he's got elite skills that Cliff didn't feel like he could coach, but he did feel like he could manage into a game breaker at the quarterback position. And Cliff didn't want to jack with that. What, he, what Cliff did is serve up concepts, serve up ideas. And I think that's an incredible way to coach. And Patrick is so blessed in that when he was going through the draft process, he told his agents very specifically, I don't want to go to the highest pick. I don't want to go to this, that, and the other. I want to go to the best situation. And Andy Reid and, and the coaching philosophies that he has is he allows freedom and creativity uh, and fun, which is very important with his athletes and with Patrick's personality, it couldn't have been a better fit. There, there's so many scenarios that could have turned out differently, but it, it's just the perfect situation. He's blessed with that. And I think that's something a lot of people forget that, you know, why does this first round draft pick guy not make it his first or second year? Half of the NFL is where you fit, you know, in Chicago, everyone complains about Mitch Trubisky. We could have taken Patrick Mahomes first. I don't think Patrick Mahomes would have been Patrick McCombs if he, if he came to Chicago. I think it was just a fit in where people seem to fit. I know some people say the best athletes aren't in the NFL right now, that it was, they didn't fit into the system that the coaches wanted. And so that's what's kind of, you know, people say this or that about Patrick or all these other people, but people forget, do you fit into the system that you went to? And I think Kansas City, uh, he fit into the system or they built a system around him based on what his skills were. I absolutely agree. But we also can't underestimate an athlete's ability to fit in a system. That's yeah. a skill set as well. And, um, you know, when they, when they call a kid a bust, I think it's just a combination of a lot of factors. You know, the GM did make a bad decision always. It's like you said, Chris, is that are the coaches really recognizing what makes this individual, what's their signature uniqueness, like what makes them different? Are they trying to create an opportunity for them to thrive in those with those attributes? Um, are, are their lifestyles uh, decisions changing because they got drafted? Um, is the culture of that team conducive to their personality? If all these things are off, then the kid might not be a bust. That's why people have great second careers. Yeah, you know, I, I think Mitch Trubisky can play quarterback. I don't think he's, I don't think he's the problem. Um, if he was, he wouldn't have had glimpses of really great plays and great games. 
Um, he, he's shown he can do some of those things, right? Um, you take your guy, Montgomery, like, what's he doing this year? Okay, it's, what's different? Was he, I mean, could he not play before? Yeah, physically, he's better. He's got better training. But let's be honest, it's to a lot of these coaches and systems, it can be like flavors of ice cream. There's a lot of good ones. But it's got to fit with what you're, what you're serving up. Now, I've become fascinated for some reason the last six months with, <laughs> with soccer, a game that I've never sat through in my life, never played in my life. But, um, but soccer seems so interesting to me. Nine miles of running in a game, 99% aerobic, 99% at 50% of max speed or less. However, if you ask a college soccer coach to describe their best player, they'll always say fast, powerful, explosive. And so we had a guy named Mike Whiteman, who I asked him if anybody else trains like he does. And he said, no, but he basically wants to train soccer players for things that are not really a part of soccer. And that is to lift heavy, run fast, jump high, jump far. Would you concur with that? Have you ever worked with soccer kids? We have, and, and I've got some good relationships in the Premier League. Um, I've got some friends in the, on the Chelsea side and the Man U side that I've met through fellowship and um, have had some interesting com conversations. Um, but I think there's a lot of different schools of thought. I, I want to pivot on this and kind of bring up four athletes and, and bring perspective. So let's think of Luka Doncic, LeBron, Messi, Patrick. Okay, all four of these athletes – if you watch them, they walk around, they move very, very slow, unless they're moving very, very fast. They, there's not, there's no middle. They're the, so the word that I want to communicate here is efficiency. They understand efficiency and they understand the demands of environment and they're able to access a higher level of speed when they need it. I think one of Patrick's teammates of the day tweeted, Patrick is one tenth faster than the guy that's chasing him at all times. Okay. Messi, LeBron, Luka Doncic have all been labeled as lazy in games before. They're not lazy. This is called efficiency. This is their body understanding what is going to be required and what is needed to solve the current problem. Just because Patrick's not moving fast doesn't mean he can't. It's because he knows he doesn't have to. And he's trying to solve a problem. Messi's the same way. He's slow until he strikes. And when he strikes, no one's seen that speed before. LeBron's the same way. And Luka Doncic is the same, the same people that are telling me that Patrick Mahomes is an agile will say Luka Doncic is an agile. The, this is something we've got to do a better job of recognizing that efficiency is a skill and, and, a, and a feat of athleticism. And what you're talking about is soccer players being able to train holistically and, and raise all, raise the tide. Right. And then being able to use those attributes on the field. I mean, the Wolverton Wolves, those that they're an example of that. They got their guys. I mean, they don't even look like the same people out there. Um, and I think that I think that soccer is a is a, an incredible opportunity for people that want to bring something different. Because the 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 inmates have been running the asylum for so long in soccer. It's like, well, I'm really good and I don't like to to train. Well, okay, is that causation or correlation? I think we know that it's correlation. That was a good slide, by the way, with the, uh, <laughs> what was with it? Swimming pool drownings in Nicolas Cage movies? Yeah. yeah. That was I think he should go to jail. I, mean, I think he should too. I mean, obviously. He's killed a bunch of people, hasn't he? He has. Uh, just, just like, just like uh, your team's averaging squad over 600 pounds has won a lot of national championships. I mean, it's the same. Same thing. Um, you talk about tradition, and I love talking about tradition, and I can pivot a little bit to the idea of process, where coaches are constantly saying, trust the process to me, yeah. which means the process it cannot really be justified or explained very well, and it's like, just go through this, and it's going to work, guys, I promise, and you kind of question tradition the same way I question process, that, that everything we do no matter how much in love with the traditional aspect or the prospect, uh, the, the whole process aspect of it needs to be questioned constantly. I agree. I, look, process is, I don't have time for process. I need to know if something's working right now. You know, I, me, 
So when I'm training an athlete, look, one area where you could use the, 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 the word, the nomenclature process for Tiger Woods redoing his swing when he's the best player in the world, that's a process. The reason that's a process is because he's literally going to take a step back from the results standpoint before he takes a step forward. That's a process. So in skill acquisition, there could be process. Why, why would you call it that? Because there's going to be a super adaptation to that. There's going to be a time where you rebound. In training, we don't have to have that all the time in order to get gains. So I don't need a process. I tell my coaches that work for me, I tell my team, I tell my people, I'm like, this is not a process thing. They should be better at this today. If they're not better at this today, the training sessions suck. Like that's, that's my expectations. Okay. Now that's not across the board with every single agenda that we have or box we want to check, but overwhelmingly we are just over reliant on process. There's no reason 80% of these things need to be a process of anything. Fix it today. If it's not a physiological marker or problem, it's neurological. Neurological things can be fixed now. They can be fixed today. They can be fixed in about 14 seconds. So I just, I agree with you. It can be overdone. I think there's a way to look at it. There can be value in the word, but if I'm honest with you, I think it's an excuse that people, professionals in our field use to give themselves time and to put the own ownership onto the athlete. And I think it's lazy. And I think it also leads into something that I love to talk about how in, in my program, I want kids to be in a state of performance every damn day. And that is not traditional. The traditional way to practice was more of a process, more of a, like you said, the warm-ups are oftentimes going through the motions. And that was acceptable to many coaches back in the day. And that, that practice, even though the games are at 80%, they practice for three hours at 60% because that was the process to get them ready to play. And so it seems like your guys, I mean, they only get one shot at every drill they're doing. You guys, your guys are performing at every workout. They are. And that is our in-season model. In the off-season, I'll be honest, not every single thing is like that, but there are still threads of that that are, that are consistent. So I would agree. I think, you know, I got slaughtered a couple of years ago on social media because you know, there's a big movement for big squat Wednesday in Texas. Um, and I just made it pretty clear. We're not going to do heavy squats on Wednesdays in any program that's associated with APEC. And um, like, well, why not? This is many state championships. And, and I'm, I'm like, well, I just didn't make sense to me. So people that work for me and our company, we're not going to do it. Well, why didn't it make sense to you? I said, because, I actually would like to try to work whatever speed I can on Thursday or Friday or Saturday because speed is the key performance metric that I'm judged on. And it's the thing that I think is most important that we value. And if I do heavy squats on a Wednesday, I am not going to get any speed adaptations on Thursday or Friday. I can try to run fast, but that's not the same as speed development. So they're like, well, I don't, I disagree. And I'm like, well, you know, I disagree that the sun's out right now, but I can open these windows and the sun is shining through here. So we don't do that, but I think there's just a lot of dogmatic things. And, you know, if you're, if you're, if the most important thing in your pro program is heavy squat, that makes perfect sense. You should do that on Wednesday for us. It's not. So those are some of the things we work through. And these are people that I, that I respect and they've done great things and they do great things, but it all comes down to values, perception, communication, and execution. Um, and so I'm with you. I like more every day is game day type of training. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to shoot the horse in the leg and then tell it to run fast. That's not my deal. I love it. That was really a thing. You're not making that up. That's not only, is it really a thing? I mean, there was a, there's a, a one of the, some really highly respected people that made that a big deal that it still is a thing. I mean, it's a, it's a thing right now. There's, they wear t-shirts. So every Wednesday, everyone wears the same t-shirt too? I don't know if everybody does, but it says Big Squat Wednesday on it, and they go for new maxes. And again, look, not, not making fun, there's been some great programs associated with this. And it's not just one group. It, it actually comes from some people that have had a lot of success on some high levels in the NFL and some other places, and they do a lot of great things. 
I'm just saying for our company and for what we do, if speed is a priority, we can't afford to do big squat wins there. Yeah. You know, if they had a lot of success and you can correlate a lot of state champions in football to people that did that. Now, we will never know how much of an effect that had on. However, um, it's something that we chose not to do. And I kind of got reprimanded for that. Um, but that's okay. So. Well, in football, a lot of times, it seems like everybody does very similar things. It's so if everybody, if everybody's going heavy squats on Wednesday, it's very possible on Friday that the dumb team beats the dumber team. Yeah, I mean, look, if, if we all cut our arms off and then we have a boxing tournament and then we have a one arm boxing champion, that doesn't mean that cutting your arm off is the way to be a boxing champion. It's just <laughs> like, what are we doing, guys? Like, you know, at what point are we going to look at common sense? In the kingdom of the blind, the one eyed man is king. <laughs> yeah. <you're right. laughs> Chris, you got anything? I'm out. I'm good. Good. Hey, um, we're so sorry that we started 30 minutes late. Yeah, I don't know what that was about, but... Hey, Blake must have been on a bender or something. No, 